time we're a series has certainly had its ups and downs. We have now reached the conclusion of the series and in my opinion, the most interesting and intriguing book within the arc. Due to its strange setting, the Doctor dancing with death on the moon and the finale to battling a giant dragon-like entity known as the Time Worm with a space astronaut just chilling in the background. And this is my second time reading the book. My original review got deleted, it's gone. And I can't lie, I didn't remember a thing about reading this book. Absolutely nothing. Characters, setting, conclusion, what happens with the Time Worm, how it plays out in the whole connection to the new adventures, nothing. But one thing I do remember about it originally is that my rating for it in the original review was a 7 out of 10. And with my review of the series so far, all the ratings have stayed exactly the same. Time Room Genesis with a 2, Time Room Exodus with a 9, and Time Room Apocalypse with a 5. So this is just a repeat, and it's another identical rating of a 7 out of 10. So, how did Time Room Revelation fare out? Was it better than I expected? Was it the same with a 7 out of 10, or was it worse? Hmm. Let's find out. Paul Cornell is a name that is synonymous with the Virgin New Adventures, along with his introduction to the Virgin New Adventures by concluding the Time Room series, is the man to introduce us to the character of Bernice Summerfield in Love and War, and a character within the extended media and wilderness years who is highly respected and loved. So much that the very beginning of Big Finish production started with adapting Bernice Summerfield original novels from Virgin Publishing. And the book, which eventually became an adaptation, oh no it isn't, opened the door of Doctor Who entering a world of forecast audio drama. Paul Cornell had popular novels, just to mention a few, Love and War, Human Nature, the story adaptation we see in series 3 of the new series, but Paul Cornell is not just known within the Doctor Who space, but also urban fantasy genre including his Shadow Police series, beginning with London Fallen, Marvel and DC Comics, and a 5 book series called The Witches of Lichford, and other standalone novels. According to Paul Cornell himself, he implies this, saying he likes to keep the pace one or two steps in front of the reader. So he's one of these writers, especially in Time Room Revelation, but he likes to be ahead of the reader themselves. What does that mean? It can be a little bit complicated, a bit confusing, but I would say this. You need to be in the right frame of mind to read this book, because if you, if you have a lot of stuff on your mind, and you're quite scatterbrained or whatever, and you've had a busy day, like I do programming for a living, and my brain is just coding in my head. And if it's like that, I probably won't enjoy this book. I just need a nice day off where I don't have to think of anything else but read awesome Doctor Who books, and yet that'll be the right frame of mind and the right day to read this book. And it's very easy to miss parts of this book, just very small pieces of dialogue which actually has a lot of weight to it in terms of the story and you can very just easily just glimpse over it and not really take it in and if you don't you might get confused along the way because if you reference them and go why on earth is this being referenced? I haven't seen it yet but you probably did and you glimpsed over it and just didn't take it in so yeah it's just one of those novels I wouldn't really call it confusing or complicated per se, it's just you have to pay attention and just have a nice day where nothing's on your mind. But yeah, the cover pretty much tells the story of what this book is going to be like. It's wacky, it's strange, and it's got some very interesting and unique concepts. It's uh, weird and wonderful, as I like to say, with uh, a few of these Doctor Who stories, and I think that's what Doctor Who is all about, weird but wonderful. Even the beginning of this novel is pretty like okay. We already witness an eight-year-old Gil 
be murdered by a character named Chat. The girl who got murdered was Dorothea. Obviously we know who that is. And Dorothea is someone who always wanted to become an astronaut. Hmm, there's an astronaut depicted on the cover. She dies instantly by Dorothea's skull being split open by a brick. This is where Ace died. So this is quite of a interesting beginning to this novel. Because this scene, I won't go too much into it because this book can be very easily spoiled. That was a what-if scenario that played out. This was a situation that happened with Ace. But in the original timeline of that event, she survived the altercation. In this what if version, she died from it by a character named Chad, who is her old high school bully. But this character really isn't just a stereotypical bully character. A little bit more than that, but we'll get to him later. So the synopsis of the book, the back blurb, it doesn't really tell you much. It's very nuanced and ambiguous. And Cornell keeping this book and everything pretty much a mystery. Why there's a church on the moon. Connection does Ace have to this astronaut figure? Why is the Doctor dancing with death? And where the hell are they? There seems to be an apparent haunting and a spirit within the church. And how does the time room connect to this whole novel? How does everything connect together? So I think this review will be a little bit shorter than others because there are a lot of... There is context within this novel which I'm simply just not going to cover because it will ruin the book and it will ruin the experience because Paul Cornell has written this book in a way where I've stated he keeps it a mystery and you're the one who has to put the pieces together. Almost, that's how it works. So... Why would I spoil it and ruin it for you? Not going to cover spoilers at all in this review. Just minor things, but nothing major. Don't want to ruin it. Which that might give you a little hint of what I actually think about this book. This book is freaking amazing. I'm very happy to say that. I'm glad it's not a repeat of Time Room Genesis, which was just complete trash. And it wasn't a bore fest like... Time Room Apocalypse, which, which was just painfully average, really. So it's uh, up there with uh, Exodus. Very happy to say that. I really could not remember how this book went down originally when I read it in 2017. Couldn't remember a thing about it. So, yeah, I would say it was like reading a, a new book. So, let's do my in-depth review of Time Room Revelation by Paul Cornell. So Time Room Revelation does get its praises from fans, but not everybody sings its praises. It goes from, oh my goodness, this is one of the best Doctor Who books of all time, to something like, I don't know what the hell I just read. My mind is a confused blob of sludge right now. So I feel when it comes to the reviews, a big part that comes to play here is simply just not being the right, in the right frame of mind, which I think why I originally gave it a 7 out of 10. So, do I consider it one of the best Doctor Who books of all time? Or did my mind become a pile of sludge due to the mind fuckery of Time Room Revelation? Uh, no, I didn't. As I stated, I freaking loved this book. Do I declare it one of the best Doctor Who books ever? In terms of its concepts, and its ideas, I would say it's definitely up there. In terms of a story, not quite, but in terms of its concepts and its themes and its ideas, I would say this is a really good cracking book. The scenes of Ace in the TARDIS supposedly during darkness is Ace contemplating about her situation and life. She is wondering what the Doctor is doing behind her back. She hears the TARDIS land and when the Doctor believes she is not awake, Ace believes 
through the Doctor's actions, he is hiding something. The truth. Doesn't reveal himself. Plays chess with the lives of others to get the desired outcome. Playing God. This is what upsets Ace. And the Doctor does inform it's who he is. And the Doctor says that the Nazis in Exodus were nothing more than toddlers compared to what the Time Lords were capable of. And that is what the Doctor experienced and lived on Gallifrey and shaped him the way he is. And Ace has a hard time accepting this reality. Ace believes she hears the Doctor or someone shouting in the TARDIS. Through the voice did sound different to her own admission. The character interaction and development by Cornell is sublime. Who is already an established name with his contributions to the Doctor Who fanzines. They're supposedly in the 19th century, where the Doctor is apparently acquainted to and its people. That is alluded in the prologue section as well. At this point, you don't know what the book is going to do. So this village they are supposedly located in has a very false feeling. Something is rather off, peculiar, and you can't really get your head around it. Why? Because even though the book cover is depicted of a church on the moon, if you don't know where this book actually takes place, you probably wouldn't figure out where it takes place until the Doctor actually references where they are. It's a very cool concept. The Doctor approaches a character named George, who seems to be on the edge and terrified of the dark, the presence inside the church, and the activity of demons, and the rather odd reverence, as he says. But the Doctor explores the church, but not any signs of this apparent activity. What Ace is experiencing, however, seems to be even more concerning and terrifying. She finally gets some shut-eye, and then the appearance of a spacesuit figure staring right at her and seeing the reflection of her face in the visor. However, never made any form of physical attack. We also understand this spacesuit figure plays somewhat of a connection with the character of Dorothy of when Ace was eight years old. He always wanted to be an astronaut and was mocked and belittled to destroy her dream. What gets even more weird is the spacesuit was inside the TARDIS wardrobe and used in a previous event while Ace was traveling with the Doctor. So there's some form of connection with this spacesuit figure. So Paul Cornell sets up all these very intriguing like plot points and you're saying to yourself, how on earth is he gonna connect these all together? Because they, they feel so bizarre. That's what you question yourself like, how does a haunted church, a space astronaut, this what if scenario of Ace being killed, and the whole landscape connect to each other? Yeah, mindfuckery. <laughs> but the book has really strange aura in the beginning, and I absolutely love it. The atmosphere and the surroundings, and the feeling of something being off. You can't quite picture it. Supernatural activity and a spacesuit figure wandering around a haunted church. How does it all connect? At this point, your guesses are as good as mine. It's Cornell's writing style, always being two steps ahead of the reader, teasing you to keep you reading to find out these answers. Didn't I say things get odd? Because uh, yeah, in chapter two, things really do get odd. The book wastes very little time in getting you excited with the story. The people in this village aren't exactly, well, people. One of them, in quite a terrifying scene, slowly turns into dust and fades away while George is there, smiling. And that makes you think back, when this character just seemed like a timid individual scared of the dark and the church. But now he's enjoying the process of what just happened. And the Doctor looks at him with a sickened expression on his face of what he just witnessed. And out of the blue, we have a returning character. And I'm not going to give you any clues, hints, or references of who this person is. I'm not going to do it. Read the book. The only thing I will say, this is a character who is out for revenge. 
So this individual has a motive of revenge and the Time Worm is using that motive to an equipped an individual within her power. So I'm going to call this character just nameless. But I will discuss what the character does later on with the novel which comes into the second half of the novel and that will be it for the character. By the words of this nameless character, Ace was abducted in connection to the phantom spacesuit figure. But it's later revealed that Ace is found dead within the church. Meanwhile, features somewhere different altogether with the character Dorothy. This character Chad, yeah this kid is a one sick individual. Ace's bully, who wants to do brutal and horrific things against her. We have this so-called angel voice who is talking to Chad, which we know who it is. But where Ace is located, you don't really know where she even is. If it's a dream state, an illusion. She makes the reference that she is in fact dead and looks up at the moon and she stumbles into an auditorium. Having the feeling she is surrounded by familiar people cheering her name and a female voice speaks to her who says she needs to go on a journey but that journey remains a mystery. The character development for Ace in this novel is freaking fantastic. So far, out of all the books, this is the best characterization of Ace so far in The Virgin New Adventures. Genesis, load of shite. Exodus, pretty damn good. Apocalypse, Nigel Robinson actually did fairly well with the characterization, but this one, right up there, just levels above. Really, really solid character development and writing, and plays on the whole concept, not just with Ace, but the Doctor too, of guilt. It really does make me excited for Love and War and her reflecting her life. Before she tried fitting in, but she was just being a false version of herself to be accepted and Ace currently lives a conflicting life. Does she live with pain, rejection and guilt as Ace? Or nothing but a false version of herself, becoming nothing, floating loved in nowhere? Ace is a person motivated by the demise of tyranny and oppression, never giving in, and believes that the good have the right to fight evil, but often ends up in violent situations. Now she's about to face something as referenced by this unknown female voice, Going down a path, she doesn't know what she's in for. Oh man, oh man. Chapter 2 had me really invested. This is my favourite book with Ace so far. And the Virgin New Adventures. Need to reread Nightshade though just to uh, confirm that. But yeah, spot on. Uh, poor Cornell. Ace seems to be transported from the auditorium into a library room where these apparent clown-like figures are stalking the hallways, spying on Ace through the gaps, when an old man, a librarian, scares them off and helps Ace to go her own way to complete what she's been tasked to do. And things get trippy. I mean, really trippy. Ace is attacked in the library itself and sucked into a giant globe of all things. And this apparent voice who is speaking to everyone is almost playing chess in this world, being the time we're in herself, like motivating Chad to kill Dorothea and using his vanity to commit evil. Chad isn't really motivated in just following her voice, but he wants to play God himself and not be confined to the rules and do whatever he wants with no repercussions. So yeah, Chad is just basically inherently evil. And I wouldn't say he's specifically being manipulated by the timer and just frankly used because he's already inherently evil and has the motivation to kill Dorothy anyway. So he's just an evil bastard. What happens to the village on the moon, very strange. A huge explosion happens within the church and all life is completely vaporized we have a huge figure of a dragon by the moon and you hear the voice, I have returned humans. With the moon's explosion, 
the world is left in darkness, with a voice echoing with thunder saying, Know me. What is troubling is Ace mimicked the words, Know me herself, and touched something very powerful. And when she did, guilt and the feeling of horror went through her body that she committed something very wrong. This book becomes very psychedelic and bizarre of the events that transpire of what did Ace possibly do. This is one of these books you need to be alone without disruptions. Because yeah, things do get trippy and weird. And when Ace was feeling sadness, the memory that she had was a rose. And this kind of plays a little hint and a nod to the character of Death, which I'll get to later when it comes up. The whole sequence of the Doctor and the time run by the lunar surface, it feels like a chess battle between the two. And one where the Doctor in a lot of situations feels like he is losing that battle. But he's always been the, the manipulator, the schemer incarnation of the Doctor. But what makes the time run actually really good in this novel is to strike at the vulnerabilities of the Doctor. So I love it where the main protagonist isn't always regarded as a flawless character and just inherently good and all that. It just makes a character rather boring and formulaic and just it's, in, it's done too much within media. It just makes the character of the Doctor and what I love about the extended media just so much more interesting and just gives the character a lot more dimension. Again, the new series and the modern series, which fair enough that they won't, just will not go down that direction. So to appreciate this kind of like direction for the character, you simply just have to look at the Virgin New Adventures and the Wilderness Years stuff. But personally for me, I really appreciate that. So they're both battling each other and not revealing their full deck of cards. So the Doc is hiding some of his cards, also the Time Worm. So it's a big chess battle between the two. And you definitely get that feeling. That feeling is really evoked within the book. The Time Worm goads the Doctor into allowing her freedom to feast and destroy. And the Doctor has his regrets. As this entity has the reputation, even the worst villains and monsters give a nickname based on fear. The Doctor asks for mercy to spare Ace's life, but with little success and warns the Doctor she doesn't underestimate him, so the Time Worm sees the Doctor as a worthy opposition. The Doctor disgruntled with the idea of mercy being out of the question, leads to the character into more darker aspects of the character to defeat the Time Worm. Even though I'm not person I'm not going to mention it at all like what happens but I'm not really too much of a fan of how they dealt with the time where I'm a bit odd it's not really how I would have done it but that's all I'm going to say about it Ace keeps theorizing her head that she is in hell with these really creepy nurses who she spots dragging this nameless character where the doctor encounters and I will not spoil towards the doors only in the waiting room only to ominously close behind them. Without giving it away how the atmosphere and the environment has been described by Paul Cornell, it is divided by seven different sections which span infinitely. And within the centre, they call it the pit. The Doctor calls it that the most evil horrors exist within the pit, There also could be the freedom to home. So... The fact that it's divided into seven sections is actually a hint of where they are. But not only that, the Time Room's origins are revealed within this book. And I personally say it's not the most interesting lore and context surrounding a Doctor Who villain of who she was before Ishtar, then became Ishtar as a cybernetic monstrosity and turned into a monstrous figure of a dragon who consumes and destroys. The Time Room is written differently in Genesis. She was like a matriarch in the book. Here I would say she's more straightforward, but a lot more cunning, calculating and playing chess with the Doctor. Books feel like they are more standalone rather than just an entire arc. Because looking at this series as an entire arc, rather than just in 
individual books, yeah, I wouldn't say it's the best. As depicted on the cover, the famous Doctor Dancing with Death plays out while leaving the church's doors. The time room is pleased and she says you're in my domain now when the Doctor completed the dance with death. What happens with death after she fades away is rather interesting. In a sense of sadness and a memory of a rose. Interesting eh? Ace had that exact same memory and what was it? A rose. Also, they're in a maze full of roses. So yes, this novel in some way has everything, a lot of it is connecting to Ace herself. When the Doctor did the dance with death, the Doctor says he's done the first stage. So the Doctor definitely did something that the time where isn't aware of, but sets up multiple questions. And within the novel, Ace has a brutal, horrible battle with this character, childhood bully Chad who harbours disgusting hatred for Ace, for simply for who she is. He is quite the racist and the sexist. He's just everything. But even worse, he is just a disgusting psychopath who thinks of the most horrendous methods to kill Ace. I'm actually quite surprised how brutal and horrendous this character acts on what he wants to do. He was written even more like a psychopath compared to the characters within Tyrone and Exodus, who were in fact Nazis. And this Chad character is a kid. So this kid, one messed up character that Paul Cornell created, it's like he tried to create the worst kid imaginable. The first half is simply amazing. You need to follow it quite strictly because you could glimpse over pretty crucial dialogue but the location and the atmosphere where they are is just so unique and exciting from library hallways, creepy auditoriums, a maze full of roses, the dark and bottomless pit within the middle. But without revealing where they are, this world acts as like a dimension of where your worst nightmares and fears are used against you. The Doctor and Ace's relationship is crumbling down. Ace hates that she relived that experience of her childhood bully and school years, and the Doctor didn't save her from the church. She says to the Doctor, am I nothing but a pawn? Angrily to the Doctor while he battles the Time Worm, which is exactly what she wants the Time Worm. She wants to use the Doctor's regret and his guilt of his past companions who died under his name to destroy the relationship between Ace and the Doctor. But it's still present and they still respect each other but it is going down more and this of course is a lead up to Nightshade and Love and War. The timer room is playing more than chess but striking at the very heart of the Doctor's weaknesses. His guilt and his regret. And that's something which the time room does really good within this book of just striking jabs at the Doctor, which really makes the Doctor look like a vulnerable character, not indestructible, and a real character for that instance. Where this book is not really ashamed to target the entire character of the Doctor, rather than just paint him as just a character simply for good. And it certainly makes me, and it certainly makes me interested in how they will play that within Cat's Cradle, because this feels like it would be a really good lead up into Nightshade anyway completely cutting out Cat's Cradle, so we need to see how that works. Best depiction for the time where I'm, I'm very happy to say that, because if it wasn't, then Genesis would have been the worst, sorry, the best depiction of the time where I'm, and that book fucking sucks. It does, I'm sorry, story just sucks. We're in the time where I'm okay, but story sucks. Yeah, I'm glad that Revelation is the best depiction, because time where I'm, was barely in Exodus, well, barely had a role in Exodus and Apocalypse. This wasn't the star of the show, which was a big mistake. Not only is Chad a side villain, but the nameless character too, as I referenced coming back from a previous story, who exploits the Doctor's guilt and discusses his project Inferno, and having a lot of fascinations with fascism about this alternative universe was created, 
with the doctor's nightmare of seeing people close to him as evil characters that he loves. Unfortunately for me, I don't think this nameless character, mind you, warranted enough to be in the book. I don't think they had enough involvement in this book to warrant them coming back because comparing this character to Chad, who is just a horrendous psychopath, I just don't think this individual levels up to someone like him. Which, if you know who this character is, that is absolutely crazy that Chad is more of a crazy psychopath to this character. So, And then again, I don't think what this character did within the book was enough to warrant his return. So, yeah, a bit disappointing there, personally. And I would say the first half, for me, was better than the second half. It was a little bit padded within the second half, but ultimately a very, very enjoyable book. And that is where... I am going to end it because I do not want to spoil Time Room Revelation for you. So I'm going to have to keep it rather ambiguous in terms of its context of how the book is solved. I think it's done rather well, but as I've said multiple times, you do have to keep up with it and have, and have really nothing on your mind. Otherwise you will glimpse over important dialogue. And you will simply just be confused and you just won't know what's going on. So, yeah, be in the right frame of mind before you read this book. But overall, Time Room Revelation was a fantastic read. I really enjoyed it. Now, which one do I prefer? Revelation or Exodus? Because that's been in my head a bit. But if I was to break them down, they they are rated pretty equally to me. They feel quite similar to each other. If I was going just solely on concept and ideas, I would give it to Revelation. But just my enjoyment for the story alone, I would give it to Exodus. But their ratings, they kind of feel similar. So, I'm giving this book a 9 out of 10. Although Exodus slightly remains the better story for me, this book shines into simply a different way. And they're both in the same ballpark in terms of rating. I've referenced this multiple times. The Time Room series kind of encapsulates the entire Virgin New Adventure series of how it goes down. You have its stinker, Genesis. You have its classic bona fide adventure, Exodus. You have your rather average read, Apocalypse. And then you have your unique, bizarre, weird and wonderful novel, Time of Revelation, but this was a good book. But what about the series itself? It felt a little bit scatterbrained. It felt a little scatterbrained because the whole Time of arc itself, I feel just wasn't really up to par. Because in Genesis, Genesis, there's a terrible setup, but at least she was written okay. But then following with Exodus and Apocalypse, they just felt like simply single individual novels. And that's where I think it struggles to have a consistent and an enjoyable arc from start to finish. It just felt like they were two really good individual books. One of them so happens to close off the series. But then one was a bore and then one was a stinker. And then the overall arc was like, eh, whatever. So I would probably give the overall Time Room series like a... I got, oh, well, I've done two 9 out of 10s here. I've done one 2 and then one 5. I'm going to give it like a maybe a 6 or a 7 out of 10 overall. That's kind of where I feel, so I'm just going to go 6.5 out of 10 right straight for the middle. Yeah, it's not like one of the groundbreaking Doctor Who arcs, by no means. I think this more stands out just by individual reads. Exodus and Revelation are clearly the standout ones. Before we get into the Cat's Cradle era, arc rather, I will be starting the Virgin Missing Adventure reviews as well, and since it, Big Finish are adapting it, Goth Opera will be in the next book review, so stay tuned for that. I gotta feed the cat. See ya. Bye. <laughs>